welcome back. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I'd like to do a quick uh, announcement of uh, another workshop on differential geometry that will be held in Maceo <coughs> in March from 16 to 20. And uh, we are organizing together with Professor Fernando Coda Marques, Harold Rosenberg, Lohan Hauschwitz, Roser Spinar, uh, the Tang Zhu, and the Larry Lencar. And uh, everybody will come to Maceo soon. So it's my pleasure to introduce the, the first talk of this afternoon, Professor Stefan Sabucho, and uh, he'll talk about sweep out estimates on Riemann manifolds. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so first, I'd like to, to thank the organizers for, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, today, also, I'll talk about sweep outs and volume on Riemannian manifolds, since it's a sweep out day, um, with the talk of you know, Fernando and Andre this morning. Uh, all right, so I also like to say that I first gave that talk like uh, in, in London, in Paris a, a year ago, and I know that some of you were already in the audience back then, so I'd like to, to apologize for that. I'll, I'll try to present things from a slightly different perspective. Um, and I'd like to, all right, so I, I got interested in this problem uh, when I read the, the following result by Chris Croak, who proved that uh, on a Riemannian sphere, okay, on a Riemannian sphere, the the length of the shortest closed geodesic is less or equal to, all right, something like that. Okay, the square root of the area. So this is the length. of the shortest closed geodesic. And this is just the, the area of, of M. Um, all right, so you know, if you think about the, the way to find a, a closed geodesic, you know that you know, we can use Birkhoff minimax principle. That's the, the classical way of doing it. Uh, and you know, using the, you know, following isomorphism uh, relating the, the topology of the loop space. So this is the loop space uh, and here that's be the, be the constant loop space. Okay, and this is in general, this is just the pi two of M, which in case of the sphere is non-trivial, right? So then you, you can use like a sweep out of the sphere by loops, you know. So here's the sort of the figure. So, so that's your sphere, and so you you start um, you start at points. at a point, and then you just sweep out uh, the sphere like that. Okay. All right, so that means that the, um, uh, in a homotopy, the, the family of loops you have must be non-trivial. Okay, so that's inverse. All right? Okay. And then what you do, you do your, your minimax principle, and you get uh, a minimax value. So B is for Birkhoff here, uh, which is just the infimum over all sweepouts of the supremum over T of the length of gamma T. All right? And we know. Uh, so that's a result of Birkhoff that, uh, well, the length of the shortest closed geodesic on the sphere is less or equal to this minimax value. Okay? All right. But uh, this minimax value, you know, I mean, there's not always equality here. You know, if you look at this example, it's not the case. This, 
the shortest closed geodesic is there. And uh, here is maybe like the length of the, of the Birkhoff minimax value, right? Uh, so, and if you look at Crocs proof, I mean, he, of course he uses the Birkhoff minimax principle, but the geodesic he gets here uh, is not uh, obtained by this Birkhoff minimax principle. And actually it cannot be obtained like that, okay? Because here's an example where that's the classical example where you see that the, um, so the length, the, the shortest closed geodesic, oh yeah, the shortest closed geodesic is here. So it's a figure eight closed geodesic. So it goes to zero, okay, it's very small. And uh, LB, okay, goes to infinity, here it is. Okay, it goes, goes up here and back here, all right? And the area is very small, all right? So in this, in this theorem, uh, you cannot replace the length of the shortest closed geodesic with, the, with this value, okay? All right, so that's, um, well, what, what I'd like to do is just, I mean, it's a little bit disappointing because we'd like to be able to find a way to, to construct or to find this shortest closed geodesic. Um, but so instead of using the um, Birkhoff minimax principle, we can use uh, um, like a, a minimax principle over the one cycle space because okay, so that's the Almgren Pitts minimax principle. And so we have this one cycle space. Okay, which is defined like that. All right, okay. We, you know, we, uh, as, yeah, uh, Fernando and Andre uh, talk about that space already this morning, but here's, you know, sort of a way to, to do it. Uh, so it's a one cycle. Okay, so here I'll just focus on one cycles. That's not the, the real definition, by the way, but. Uh, so, it's the, so you want the boundary to be zero. So here the AI, either, I don't know, in Z or, I don't know, maybe Z2, and the CI are just uh, arcs, okay? Uh, and there's the, the flat topology that you consider in that space, the flat norm topology. Uh, which is defined, so the distance between two cycles, Z and Z prime, is just, again, that's sort of a rough definition, is just against, it is just the infimum of the area of all the surfaces with boundary uh, Z1 and Z2. Okay, all right. And, uh, and we know that we have a similar result here. To we have that the, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, gonna, well, well, maybe I can just write it here. So we know that the, um, the, again, we can relate the topology of the loop space, of the one cycle space uh, to the topology of the manifold. And actually here, in our case, it's gonna be H2. Uh, and again, if it's a sphere, this is non-trivial, okay? And we can do, you know, a minimax principle the, the same way, you know, with Z0 and Z1 trivial, and ZT, okay, so it induces, it just it induces a, a non-trivial class in, in the homotopy. All right. And this time, we have this uh, other minimax value uh, defined with one cycles instead of loops. Okay. 
And again, and, and now we have also, so we, we have a similar result, uh, which is due to, I don't know, I don't know, I would say pits and Calabian cow. Okay, so, so the length of the shortest closed geodesic on the sphere is bounded from above by this min max value here. Okay. Okay. So working with a um, with um, with one cycles has several advantages. Uh, or maybe sh should say one way to, to produce to produce a, a sweep part would be just to consider a Morse function. Okay. And then you just take the level sets of this Morse function for your for your cycles. Okay. So, so, so one of the advantage of using this min-max principle of using one cycles. Okay, so that's okay if you have like a level set, if you, is that you can cut and paste the loops. And you see here, you know, if you look at this, here's the shortest closed geodesic on, on the sphere, on this sphere. Um, you see that if you, you, you can contract, you can actually homotop this loop here, just, just this loop, okay, to a point without increasing its length. Okay, same thing here, same thing there, and there. You know, you can go also the, the other way, and you, you have like a, um, a homotopy of loops, and you don't increase the, the length, okay? It's an increasing length of homotopy. And you can put them together, starting you know, with these two points there, so you get these loops, and then here you get your, the shortest closed geodesic, and then, and then you can just do a sweep out like that, all right? So in this case, you see that the, the length of the shortest closed geodesic in this example is just, is just uh, this minimax value, all right? So it's, it's shorter than the, the one you get using um, uh, loop sweep outs, all right? And so now we have the following results. Uh, I guess we have oh, and another uh, advantage of working with the one with the one cycle space is that, as I said, you can cut and paste loops together, but you can also work to work also works for um, other surfaces, not just the sphere, but surfaces with uh, with genus, because here what you get you have you have a homology, right, and not just homotopy here. So we have the following result obtained by with a Barashev. So we prove that. Um, so let M be a, a closed genus G Riemannian surface um, then the LZ is bounded from above by, well, by the, well, in terms of the area, and there's a constant here which grows like that, okay? And this is, of course, less than the length of the shortest closed geodesic. All right, so on the sphere, um, on the sphere we get a, a way, I mean, we have like a, an effective way to find a, the, a, the, uh, a closed geodesic whose length is bounded 
from above in terms of the Earth. The area? No, Wait, I mean, it's just the area of M. The constant here, this one doesn't, doesn't depend on the genus, but yeah, so, and on the sphere, the genus is zero. Right. Yeah, would be would be G. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing that you, okay, and you, that's the best you can do. You, you cannot. You, we have examples showing that. All right. Up to this constant here, this is the the optimal behavior. Okay. And the examples we have are actually hyperbolic. Yeah, the first. The, yeah. But, yeah. Okay, I mean, it's just yeah. Okay. Um. All right. Okay. So I, I'd like to to give uh, the idea of the proof here. And then I I'll, I'll show how to to extend this result in in higher dimension. All right, so okay, so I think everything is sort of based on the following result. Uh, oh yeah, well in in, this, in the proof though I don't I don't have to to do that, but I'll sort of approximate the, the surface with a you know with a, a simple simplicial metric, like a, a piecewise flat metric um, made of equilateral triangles. All right, so here. So let M be a, a closed simplicial surface. Um, okay. Of genus G. And then um, There exists a decomposition of M into uh, two simplicial domains, into two simplicial domains, um, okay, D1 and D2 such that the length of the boundary, of the common boundary of the domains um, is bounded from above by that. Okay, so here, here we have C0, uh, then you take the, the minimum between the area of D1 and D2, And you divide that by, um, call it n zero. And you divide that by the, the square root of the area of n zero. Okay. All right. So and the, so this is, this is really easy. I mean, it's it's just, you just use the the, the, the Chiga constant. Okay. If you use the Chiga constant, um, which is defined like that. The, so you look at dif different ways of splitting your your surface into two domains. Uh, well, let's see, put it in this way. Okay, so. Oh. Um, Okay, so that's a Chiga constant, and we know that the uh, the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian is bounded from below by one fourth of the Chiga constant 
squared. And this is Chigurh's inequality. And we also know that we have this inequality. Uh, so I think it's 24 pi, maybe g plus 1. And this is a result of Li and Yao. If you just put the, the two together, uh, you get that h of m squared times the area is less or equal to 96 pi g plus 1. And then, if you, so if you just take the square root of that and the, the area underneath here, you get the you get this result, okay, by definition of the Chiga constant. Okay. And this is this is just C zero. Oops, well just just that part is C zero. Okay. All right. So that's that's the starting point. Uh, because well, let me make a remark. Um, if the two domains have almost the same size, okay, meaning here you have D1, here you have D2, and then you assume that um, this domain the area of D1 and D2 is between, satisfy these two, two bounds. Oops, DR. Okay? All right, so, so you, if, you, if you assume that they have almost the same size, uh, then what you get when you plug that in here, you get that the length of the boundary is, is like that. Oh, so maybe this, this yeah, one fourth, yeah. C zero and M zero. Okay? So that's pretty much this, this inequality here. You know, this this bound. I mean the the upper bound. All right. So now, if you apply this, if you uh, if you apply this, if you keep applying this construction, okay. So here you have these two domains, and if you apply this construction to on both sides, and if the okay, all right, they're, they're not going to be closed surfaces, but let's assume it works, and you can find you can split this part into two domains of, again, of almost the same size, okay, you do like that. And you keep doing that. And uh, say you assume that these curves remain disjoint. There's no reason to, to assume that, but let's assume that. What you get is a, is a sort of a discrete sweep out satisfying this bound, all right? So that's sort of a, a discrete version of uh, of this result. Okay, so of course things, well, you, you, you have to, to check that, to check out that you can make it work. Um, but that's, that's the idea. All right, so let's like to give more details about that. Um, all right, so, so now you, you define, so you have these two domains, okay? So you have di here, and uh, so it's, um, it's a simplicial domain. I'm sorry. Excuse me, sorry. Uh, I, I, I don't know, that's just sort of a, a, a general idea. If they have, if, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
sorry. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know, and that's, well, that's the whole point. I mean, it's, it's this and also the fact that the, the curves, you can, the curves remain disjoint in the process. But you, you cannot assume that. Because, you know, if you have something like that, and then here you get this curve like that, or this, and it's, you, you don't really know how to, to, to make like a, a good three part out of it. So the idea is just to, so here we have a simplicial domain, and we just take a cone over the domain. Okay, it's the cone over the, the boundary of this. Um, okay. Um, and uh, so, so this is the boundary. I call it delta, the boundary of the, the domain. And uh, so what we can prove is that the sweep out, you can make a sweep out for M from two sweep outs from the sweep outs on D1 and D2, and, and you get this bound here. So it's D1. I mean, it, it really makes sense. I mean, here's the, the sort of the construction you, you have in mind. Uh, I mean, it doesn't work exactly that way, but um, so you have your first domain D1, you have a cone here. You have a second domain. I'm going to put it back to it like that. And you have a cone. That's D1, that's D2. And you have a sweep out. Of D1 and a sweep out of D2. So you just ignore this part here. Okay. Uh, just ignore this part here, and uh, you sort of go that way. Okay, that's you know sort of get a sweep out, and the point is that at the end here you just get this boundary, and you do, do the same thing here. Okay, you start here, start like that, and then when you, when you sort of hit the boundary, what you want to do is something like like this. Okay. So you know, so here you just have the union of these two curves, and at the end you just get this one. So now you can sort of merge the two sweep paths together in order to get this this bound. Okay, and here the uh, the L the, the length of the boundary is just the length of this one cycle. Okay, I mean you have to. All right, that's that's sort of the the, the general idea. Um, and um, so now, well, eventually what we want to do is to argue by induction on the number of simplices um, in, in, in M0, okay? So if there, if there are a lot of simplices, there are many simplices, if N is, N is the number of simplices in, uh, of triangles in the surface, Collateral triangle. So if n is large, I think it must be, that must be the, the value of the constant. Anyway, so if n is large, yeah, because the induction is going to be both on n and g. So if the, uh, if the number of triangles is large, then the area of, 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 Mi is less than the area of M0. And again, the proof is pretty simple. Um, we know, where is it? We have, yeah, I guess it's, wait. Um, yeah, I guess, oh no, here it is. We know okay. 
Yeah. We know that the length of the boundary is less or equal to yeah, it's over there. D D one D two over square root of N. And we also know that so M I the area of MI, the area, you know, the number of triangles in this surface is the number of triangles in the I plus the number of triangles in this cone, which is just the length of the boundary, you know, if all the triangles are equilateral triangles of, of length one. Okay. You just count the number of triangles, and if all the edges are one, um, that's what you get. So when you um, yeah. So when you use this thing okay here, maybe I should say this is so since n is large, okay, uh, this guy since n is large, this is less than one. And so, as I said, we use this relation and uh, so what we get using this inequality, we get this is always uh, less than the number of triangle in D1 plus the number of triangles in D2, okay. And that's what we wanted, all right? So, these two MIs have smaller area than the original surface. Um, yeah, maybe I guess I need that. Okay, so we can sort of now put everything together. Um, well, so we can assume we can assume that uh, L Z of M one is greater or equal to this one. Okay. Otherwise, you just switch M one and M two, so that's not a problem. And again, and for simplicity, but I'm cheating here. For some simplicity, I'll assume, I'll assume this, okay? I'll assume that. Um, but it's, I mean, it's more technical, but uh, but it, you know, it, it works also in, in the other case, but it's a little bit more technical. Okay, so, so for, for simplicity, I'll assume this, that the, the two domains have almost the same size. Okay. So we have, uh, that the, the length of the boundary um, is less or equal to, so using this, uh, this and these two things together, we have this, this. okay? And that's going to be, so yeah, three quarter of here to get the, the square of that, okay? Um, okay. So, okay, so there are two cases. First case, if um, 
if we had this inequality here, okay, so with a square root here to be homogeneous, um, well, if we have that, we conclude by induction. Okay, we know that this is M1 has fewer triangles than M0. Uh, so by induction, you can bound this ratio by roughly square root of G, and then you're done. Okay? If you don't have that, We don't have that. Uh, so on the other hand, so if we have, uh, well, LZ of M1 greater than <coughs> or equal to uh, lambda LZ of M0, where lambda is um, Is this okay? That's okay. So either we have this inequality or that one, uh, but this is less or equal to the square root of three quarter, okay? Because of that, okay, which is less than one. Okay. All right. Uh, so so in this case. Uh, so let me remind you that we have this inequality here. Um, so it's you know, the max LZ of M1, LZ of M2, plus L delta. So if you multiply everything by lambda, yeah. If you multiply everything by lambda, you get LZ of M1 here, okay? And this is, as I said, this is just LZ of M1. So when, you know, so you have this inequality here. Let's, okay, you put that on, the, on this side, so you get one minus lambda LZ of M1, which is less or equal to lambda L delta. So when you divide by one minus lambda, that's what you get. And, um, and we're done because now LZ of M0 um, which is because of this, where is it? Oh, because of that. Uh, this is LZ of M1 plus the length of the boundary. So in other words, that's what we can get, all right? The length of delta and the length of delta uh, where is it? Uh, length of delta from here is less or equal to, you know, three quarter of one 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 minus lambda three c zero, and then okay. so and that's just. A, you can control this constant because lambda is less than one. All right, so that's roughly how it goes. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, 
So now, if we want to extend this result in a higher dimension, um, there are a few things we, we need to do. Um, all right, so first, okay, so, if, so if we work now with the hypersurfaces. You work now with the hypersurfaces. Okay. So uh, again, um, Fernando and Andre this morning talked about the the space of n minus one cycles. All right, z n minus one of m. Okay, so m now is an n-dimensional, a closed remain in n manifold. Okay. So the space of one cycles is z n minus one. Uh, and again, we know something about its topology. That was Armgren's result. Um, this is just h n of m, and it's non-zero. on a closed uh, remaining manifold. Well, if you use Z2 coefficient, okay. <coughs> All right. And we can define the, the width, the N minus one width of M, you know, again, using a, a minimax principle. And here, take the volume of the N minus one volume of this n minus one cycles. Okay. And again, and the question now becomes, you know, can you get a, an upper bound on the width like that, okay? So to be homogeneous here, the power should be n minus one over n, okay? So so if you want to achieve such a bound, what you, you need is an upper bound on Chigger, on Chigger's constant, okay? You need an upper bound like that. Bound on Chigger's constant. More precisely, we need this kind of inequality here. That's the volume to the, to the one over n. Because okay. otherwise, uh, otherwise, you know, you get a sort of an, an extremal sweep out. Okay, so this sweep out is gonna divide your, your manifold into two parts of roughly the same size, okay? So here, so that's z at some point t zero. The area here would, be, would satisfy this, or the area, the volume of these two parts would satisfy this inequality here, okay? And so, so if you don't have this inequality here, what you know is that the volume of this cycle is gonna be less or equal to uh, one-fourth the Chiga constant times, um, times the volume of M, all right? And uh, and so if you don't have this inequality here, if you have something that goes the other way around, I mean, it doesn't satisfy this, what you get here is, um, is, is something like that, n minus one over n. And this is, of course, uh, and this, as I said, this is almost roughly the, the width 
So you do need an upper bound on the tier constant if you have if you want to have such uh, equal inequality here, such a bound. And um, and there's a result. Well, so there's a result by uh, Korevar that says that on a on a manifold with none. The name. So there's a result by Korevar. Well, and, and also sort of extended by Gregorian. Uh, Netruzov, Yao. Um, Colbois also, Martin. Um, so they prove that on, on a manifold with non-negative Ricci curvature, um, the Chiga constant satisfies this kind of bound here. Okay. So now. So now, so you know, so now it, it makes sense to to look at a manifold with non-negative Ricci curvature. Um, so we have the so we have the following result. Uh, okay, so Glyn, Adi, and Lyokumovich on one hand, and I on the other hand, uh, prove that. Uh, well, on a complete remaining manifold and manifold with non negative rich curvature, uh, from such a manifold for every Bounded domain D in M, there exists a Morse function F um, from D to R such that the volume. Of the level sets is bounded from above in terms of the volume of the domain uh, to the n minus one over over n, right? Okay, so we have we can find a sweep out satisfying this um, whose volume is bounded from above like that. Okay. And so as a result, now if we use um, the Armgren Pitts principle and uh, you know all the regulatory theorem by Pitts and, uh, and also Sean and Simon uh, as a corollary, we know that there exists an embedded closed Okay, so we just apply this this result when so M. Oh yeah, I didn't say that, but M now assume that M is closed. Okay, uh, M is closed, and then you apply this result when D equals M. Okay, so there exists an embedded closed minimal hypersurface M, uh, S, 
in M. So by hypersurface, I mean uh, with a single set of Hausdorff dimension uh, at most n minus eight, okay, such that the volume of this minimal hypersurface satisfies the, you know, is controlled by the volume of the whole manifold. Okay? And, um, all right. So, uh, I just need, okay, so that's the, that's the, the, the result I wanted to mention. Uh, so, as you see, here both the Ricci curvature and the inequality are scale invariant. Uh, and I also need to, um, to mention previous work uh, by Falconer, which are related to this result. So Falconer proved that a similar result. Um, so for linear k width uh, of domains in Rn, so here you have to be a little bit careful, at least for some, for some k and n, because here you have to be a little bit for some k and n. So here what I mean is that there's a domain in Rn, and then you just slice it with planes, k planes, and you do a minima principle you know, over those k planes. Okay. And you get a, a similar result here, uh, something like that, okay? With, you know, volume of the k-planes or the intersections with the k-planes is... Yeah. Okay, so here it should be k over n. Okay? And again, that's not for all k and n uh, because of, you know, Bezikovic's counterexample to the Kakia problem. Uh, I think k should be between n over two, and maybe like strictly here, and uh, n should be at least three. Uh, so, all right. So Guth uh, proved something similar, but it's a it's well a non-linear k width uh, of domain in R n. But now for every k and n. So here the, it's nonlinear because you don't take intersection with k planes, but it's more like a sweep out as, as we, um, we saw before, we considered before. But again, that's for all, you know, for all k and for all k. And, uh, and there's also this result by Treybert. Um, who proved uh, an estimate for linear k width of convex hypersurfaces? Hyper, hyper, sir, wait, hypersurfaces, hyper surfaces in Rn, uh, so you have a your hypersurface and you take the intersection of this hyper, convex hypersurface with k planes, all right? So here you get a, a k minus one uh, dimensional set. You look at its k minus one volume and then you relate that to the volume of the hypersurface uh, the same way. So, so those are, you know, previous works. The difference is that um, here it's sort of pretty general because it works for every k or almost every k, okay? Here it's only for when k equals n minus one. Uh, but I also should say that all these results rely on the linearity of the ambient manifold, or of the ambient Euclidean space, okay? Here everything is in a Euclidean space, while here it's a little bit more, more intrinsic. Okay, so that's the the, the difference. Um, and okay, uh, I should stop here.
Any questions? So you, using a, you know, this method doesn't tell you anything about the, the topology, but there, this method, the way we you know, construct the, the sweep part doesn't tell you anything about the topology of this, of the, the manifold of the, of the hypersurface. But there are some recent work uh, by, I think, Zhang or Zhao, who proved some results when, when you have Positive Ritchie curvature. Uh, I don't remember the, the result. I'm sorry. Um, and yeah, uh, I think maybe Dan should be the, the person to talk to about that. More questions? Yes. Do you have results for hyperbolic? Uh, for hyper. Uh, for hyperbolic manifold, so you want to find, um, I think, all right, again, I'm not sure, but I think they, they have something. I think they, they, they have, because here they, they consider something when the, the richer curvature can be, say, uh, greater or equal to minus one, so Glyn Adian and Jokomovic. And uh, so they, they have some results. Uh, but here, of course, the, the constant is, you know, you have to change the, the constant and it should be related to the, to the, to the, um, uh, to the hyperbolic metric. Uh, so they have some estimate. It's slightly different, but it's, we have estimate. They, they, they prove some estimates. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. I'll be back in 30 minutes. <laughs>